a preconceived sort of notion uh, in your mind of what that would like likely be. And really what I hope to do today is to expand your mind and quite literally expand the way that you think about an infographic. So most likely your perception of an infographic is something like this. This just happens to be an infographic about infographics. <laughs> and these are great. They're very uh, data rich, they're full of color, they're very interesting, but in a lot of cases you're not going to have say the time or the dollars to make this kind of investment. And we'll talk about creating these types of infographics. But I want you to just kind of think about an infographic as something maybe not so complex. And if you really just sort of break down the word, it's information that's being displayed graphically, or in short, visual communication. And there are lots of opportunities to do this that you might not think of as an infographic per se. So for example, when we designed this website for a firm in the Pacific Northwest and we wanted to communicate the fact that they had great geographic range, rather than just listing their office locations, showing that information, I'm going to start to call an infographic. It's simply showing information graphically or visual communication. Or instead of a, a three paragraph a bit of information about the firm, it's really quickly saying, hey, this is when we're founded, 99% of our work is public agencies, four services, eight offices, 120 employees, boom. Within about four seconds, you have a pretty good idea of what this firm is all about. And that's really the benefit of infographics or visual communications. It's this quick, nice, concise overview in a visual medium that tells somebody about whatever you're trying to communicate. Boom, adding icons to your services is, I'm going to call an infographic. It's adding visual communication. Now, it could be really complex. Uh, I happen to be a fan of English Premier League soccer. Any soccer fans out there? Nice. So Populous, one of my favorite architecture firms, designed this infographic as part of their delivery process. They redesigned the, uh, the Arsenal Stadium, uh, holds 60,000 people represented here. Uh, this, so this is everything that would happen on a Saturday game of a particular match even down to the four referees, the 11 players, the four substitutes, the flag bearers, the photographers. And this is a great way to sort of visually show all the activity. It's almost like a little mini city that happens on game day at the Emirates Stadium. And so anytime you can take complex information and break that down into a meaningful graphic communication, you've really done your user or your reader a great service because you've made things distilled. And let's face it, we work in pretty complex businesses and deliver complex services. So the more we can communicate that in a simple form, then we've made the user experience significantly better. So here's where we're going to go today. I'm going to talk about why infographics work. I'm going to share with you where infographic, uh, infographics can show up, kind of a best practices of where infographics work really well and perhaps where they don't. We're going to talk about how. Once hopefully you're converted, then I want to give you some tools and resources, and I want to make it really clear that while I love professional graphic designers, I am one, you don't have to be one to create infographics. So I want to give you and empower you with some great resources that will allow you to create this type of information without having to necessarily go outside and hire a firm or be a professional graphic designer yourself. So I also want to make clear, um, there were handouts if you got here early, you have got a handout. If you didn't get one, I want to make those accessible to you. And I also want to make sure the slide deck is accessible to you. And so what I'm going to ask you is if you're interested in receiving the slide deck, a whole bunch of other goodies, lists and links and information related specifically to uh, infographics, just put your, we're going to pass this around, put your business card in this pouch and then I'll, sit, I'll email that to you a couple days after the conference. So I'm going to start this over here and hopefully it'll get passed around to the other side as well. Okay, so why infographics? And I, granted, I'm, I'm going to keep this section relatively short because you're, the fact that you showed up here means you're somewhat converted to the idea of using infographics. But I just want to reinforce this 
Because even if you're convinced, a lot of times you need to convince others and tie in your firm to fund your projects. And so I want to give you some ammunition that you can then take back to your firm if you're trying to persuade your boss or anybody that happens to control the purse strings about why this is a great medium to, to work in. And I think really it comes down to this. And this is a quote from Eric Schmidt. Uh, anybody know who he is? One of the founders of Google. And he said that every two days we create as much information as we did up to 2003. Yeah, let that sink in. All the information we created up until that point, we're creating every two days. So I don't have to tell you there's information overload. You receive a ton of emails, texts. Uh, you read media, it's out there, and it's being it's a tidal wave. So the more that you can do to create an experience for your audience, for your target, for your user, that is simplified, um, as the description of the, this session said, we live in this era of big data and small attention spans. So the more you can do to help distill things down and make them simple, the more effective you're going to be as a communicator and as a marketer. So specifically, why infographics work for content marketing? And I think it starts here. At the end of the day, the only reason your firms get hired is because you have expertise. In other words, you do something that your clients can't do themselves. Sometimes they think they can, but if they really could, they wouldn't hire you. So that said, the more you can communicate your expertise in a concise way, and granted, I want to uh, acknowledge the fact that a lot of times your expertise is complex, but if you can distill it down to something that's meaningful and bite-sized, then I think you're going to be more effective. So infographic as a content marketing tool is fantastic. It allows you to communicate your expertise. And it allows you to do something the keynote said this morning, which is this idea of try before you buy, which I'll talk about in a second. But an infographic gives your audience the opportunity to get to know you, not necessarily you per se, but somebody on your firm or your firm. It gets to like that firm if they agree with the data that's being communicated. And then ultimately getting to that sort of holy grail of trust. So moving somebody along this continuum of getting to know, like, and trust. An infographic is almost like a mini project in the way that you distill information, you have a deliverable, and you communicate that information. And since it's, there's a pretty high barrier of entry for somebody to get to know, like, and trust before they hire your firm, right? So most of your firms, like, pretty much the minimum fee might be $100,000 up to you know, millions of dollars to engage with your firm. And a prospective buyer doesn't have the opportunity, like a car, to go out and test drive your firm. But if they can sort of read something or distill a bit of information that gives them enough to think, oh, wow, I think along the same lines. If your firm has a very particular point of view that you're communicating, and in that infographic, the user gets this experience and there's this resonance. There's this feeling like, oh, yeah, I like the way that they think. Now, all of a sudden, you're moving them along this continuum of getting to know, like, and trust. Like I said, they can try before they buy. It's an opportunity for somebody to get to know, like, and trust your firm before they actually have to buy. And that's fantastic because uh, there's a lot of options out there for your uh, clients, and they can choose several different directions. And ideally, of course, you want it to be your firm. So, Marketing, of course, is persuasion. We're trying to convince somebody that we're the right choice, that we're the right fit for their particular project. And communication kind of takes place in one of three ways. It takes place visually, verbally, or experientially. And let's talk a little bit about why visually works so well. So just real quick, yell out what, the, fill in this blank for me, would you? Show. Yeah, it's not tell me the proof, it's not read me the proof, it's show, right? So visual, Communication is king. And it's a great way to demonstrate authenticity, veracity, and that you know what you're talking about. And we know this because 50% of your brain is involved with visual processing. 70% of sensory receptors are in your eyes. And we really get a sense of a visual scene in less than one-tenth of a second. 
as human beings, in order to evolve, we've had to rely on our eyes to help us assess, you know, is that saber-toothed tiger friendly? Is it going to be my pet? Or am I going to perhaps be prey? And that helps us to make quick decisions. So we rely on our eyes. So visual communication is really critical and powerful. We know that 80% of uh, researchers found that color visuals increase willingness to read by 80%. So it's more engaging, right? We've got short attention spans. We need to engage our audience quickly. And visual communication does that incredibly well. According to the Wharton School of Business, 50% uh, were persuaded by purely visual. 67 were persuaded by visuals that had, or sorry, by verbals that had visuals. And if you add pictures of brain scans or mention the term neuroscience, more people think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and this isn't new, right? I certainly didn't make this up. Um, this has been going on for millennia. The caves in Moscow, France, kind of the first evidence of visual communication that we use to tell stories have been going on forever, right? So now we just have this new medium uh, that's taking that information and, and doing it in what we're calling uh, infographics. So I have a, a little quick video that sort of communicates this point of why information shown graphically is incredibly effective. In the beginning, humans created symbols. Symbols that explained their world, recorded history, and stood the test of time. Then we created languages and things got complicated. One second. Let's see if we can get a little more audio. So this is an ad, obviously, for this firm and a great resource if you're looking to incorporate icons into your work, uh, the Noun Project. Uh, you can buy them per actual symbol or pictogram, or you can buy a subscription. I'm not selling them. Um, but I love what they're saying about this quick and, and uh, clear visual communication. Anybody recognize that voice? Yeah, exactly. Roman Mars. We're going to hang out. Let's talk <laughs> afterward. I like you already. Um, great podcast if you're interested, if you need to add another podcast to your list. Uh, you can go to 99pi.org and, and check that out. So, you know, these ideas of symbols and pictograms are so incredibly powerful. You know, I don't read, and in fact, I don't even know if this is Korean or Japanese, um, but I know what this is saying, right? I can look at this and go, all right, um, I, visual communication and symbols is powerful. It takes something that's complex makes it a little more simple and direct. Uh, rather than adding words or the idea of combining words and pictures, it's powerful. And then once I do create this, I should distribute it via social media. Right? So very quickly, without having to read, I can understand what we're talking about. Again, big data, short attention spans. The quicker you can make an effective point, the more effective you're going to be in your persuasion. So, why should, so that's why you should use uh, infographics in content marketing. Let's switch over to the sort of second area where I think infographics can be incredibly powerful, which is in proposals. And proposals 
are obviously very complex. There are delivery methods, there are information about your team, there's information about your firm and differentiating, and to be able to distill that down into however many page count limit you've been given uh, is going to make your proposal much more uh, effective. And really, you need to empathize with the jury selection that has to read these 10 whatever number of proposals and create a great experience for that reader. Because that experience that the reader has is a microcosm of the experience that they could have when they potentially hire your firm. And that's all they have to go on, right? All they have is this proposal in front of them. And if you can create a really significant experience that somebody can have, then you're going to be further along in your process to be hired. So taking what is complex and making it simple is why these infographics within a proposal are really effective. And so, at, like I said, the proposal almost is the project. That's all they have to judge, whether or not your firm is going to do a great job. And it's hard, because they're looking at 10 others. And in the presentation we saw the other day, all your websites have beautiful buildings. All your websites dictate the fact that you've got hundreds of years of cumulative experience. And so you need to stand out, and this is such a great way to do it. So speaking of standing out, you need to be the white rock among others. This is a logo we designed for a landscape architecture firm. Um, but the point of this is that uh, you need to be this guy uh, rather than the other uh, eight rocks that are being put forth as proposals. So any questions about why infographics or why um, they can be effective in content marketing or as a, a tool within proposals? Let's keep trucking. All right, so now I'm going to focus a little bit on where infographics can show up. I'm going to show you some best practices, some examples of people and firms that I think are doing a nice job uh, utilizing this particular tool. So we're going to talk about some where they show up in websites, content marketing, proposals, three dimensions and beyond. And let's go ahead and start with websites. This is a firm that I admire. This is uh, Bjarke Engels Group, or BIG. And they've taken the infographic to be basically become the entire user interface of their firm. This is a list of all their projects. And they've created unique icons that are uh, representative of each one of their projects. And so the way that you navigate through their particular website is this is a chronological sorting of all their projects. So starting in 2002 to 2017, all the projects they built in 2016, quite a prolific year. It's got two columns. So you can sort that way. Um, you can also sort it by programmatic. So the theme or the color coding of these information little icons relates to the particular, um, this is work that they've done within housing, hotel, um, culture, and so I think this is a great example of, uh, of like a mini infographic that can expand out and show off their entire project. Uh, and about the firm, a uh, site we designed for LSA. And it, like I mentioned before, rather than paragraphs about how great and distinctive your firm is, real quickly, can you get a, a quick hit on what the firm is all about and encapsulate that with a series of small icons, nice combination of text and imagery that uh, it, you know, is varied, a, a relatively limited color palette that doesn't overwhelm the user. I was talking about infographics recently with a, a potential client. She goes, you know, I get it, but those things, they give me a headache. Anybody else have that experience? Like you, you look at them, and I think in most cases that's because they're just way too complex. They've got way too much color, and by limiting the palette of color, of typography, fewer if not just one font, uh, the more effective that you're going to be. Uh, BNIM, another firm that I admire, a quick hit on you know, their industry leadership using statistics and using graphical information to get a sense of what they're all about. When you're trying to differentiate yourself, uh, perhaps utilizing icons, talking about you know, how projects fit together with the, the goals. And I like the idea of, of breaking down information into digestible bits. Right? If you go to dinner, had an amazing dinner last night, anybody has a chance to go to Bluebeard here in town, highly recommend it. They didn't bring everything out at once. There was a nice progression, there was an order, and it was sort of you know, built up to a crescendo. We had some appetizers, 
We had a salad. It's a place where you, you share a bunch of small dishes. But not everything comes at once. So breaking, think of your information as a meal into digestible bits. This is the first course, the second course. This typographic rule that divides the information is nice. Um, rather than just a sea of text, they've added color for emphasis and also adding an icon. That can be really effective. Uh, timeline can be an effective way to show the history of a firm. This is something where you would click right or left and go through uh, particular information. This was part of a timeline we designed for a firm, and they didn't actually have a lot of imagery for certain things that happened in certain years, and this is probably a common challenge that a lot of you have. So there, there's no reason why you can't pull from some stock images. You know, we needed to sort of give the user a sense of where they were in the timeline. And so the idea of, of pulling in a stock image of a uh, computer, th this is when they bought their first personal computer, a relic there, and so we pulled that image. So you don't always have to utilize custom photography that you created. You can draw from other imagery that you utilize and combine type with to make it your own. So within a website, again, this is where you might use, uh, rather than sort of listing you know, facts about your paragraph form about your people. You could create infographics that give a sense of 40% of your staff watch The Office every week. Um, this is a little bit dated. 47% uh, have a Twitter account. Uh, average number of trips to Las Vegas, 13.7. And they wanted to communicate that uh, they do have international staff, so 17% come from outside the firm. So, you know, kind of a nice way to get a sense of what the culture might be like for this firm, rather than having to describe it simply in words, for somebody who needs to get a sense of what it might be like to work with your firm. This is a site we designed uh, for uh, MEP's firm, and they have offices both in San Diego and in San Francisco, and so we played on this fun sort of um, rivalry that occurs between Northern California and Southern California, and by communicating how many full-time office people they have, um, glad to see San Diego's winning, being from San Diego. Uh, locations, of course, uh, this is an electrical contractor, um, and we found this image, oh, this is a good little tip. So if you're ever needing photography that relates to space, because you are taxpayers, uh, imagery from NASA is royalty free. You can download and they have a whole image bank of, of images uh, from NASA that you can access as a good tax paying citizen. Uh, so we got this image from NASA. They would, rather than just showing your regular map because they're an electrical contractor, we wanted to show how the world, is, or at least the United States where they have offices, is lit up. And uh, so kind of information, of, you know, as you would guess, you know, big metropolitan areas have a big a set of, of lights as seen from, from space. I showed this, this one earlier, showing graphical reach. And then combining that, so on one page you, you see the visual there, but to sort of make it a little more attractive, and especially this site which was really geared towards attracting and retaining talent, so recruiting people to work for the firm, we wanted to really promote these as really highly livable cities where somebody would potentially want to live and work. So services, of course, you know, you probably offer several different services and to make them a little more compelling or make them a little bit more your own, most likely you work in a service that other firms also work in. So we designed these custom icons for them that re represent their service. And of course these live in other places beyond the website. They get a lot more value uh, in print materials as well as here in digital. You might have a continuum of service. This is the white group and uh, they offered this sort of series of whether or not you're working in a new building, this is the path that you would follow. If you're working in an existing building, this is the path. If you're doing all these things together, you get a real quick sense of, of what they're all about. So again, it's just you know, being empathetic and being uh, thoughtful about your user. And you know all this information, right? That's sort of the curse of, of knowledge, is that you know it, your firm knows it. But think about a user that's coming to your site looking and trying to get a sense of your services for the first time. It's not that you need to dumb it down, it's just that you need to clarify it and make it really easy for them to digest that information. You all probably have unique processes. You, maybe you've branded that process as you know, the 
uh, turn her away or um, whatever you might call that. Um, and adding a, a quick visual communication, this is sort of the process that we work with firms on building their brand, um, starts over here and is sequential and moves through this particular process. You might have steps and a grid, again, breaking it into digestible bits that your reader can digest uh, with icons, nice dividing typographic rules that break up the information. Uh, that, of course, is incredibly effective. So that is kind of where infographics can work well in websites. Let's transition into where it can really work well for content marketing. Of course, in terms of research, if your firm is doing custom research or it's tapping into existing research, being able to communicate that research in a way that is visually interesting is going to make it more effective. LMN, a firm in the Pacific Northwest, architecture firm, does a great job with their custom research. Um, they're doing research here on university buildings and specifically how people interact peer to peer um, in terms of, of what happens within these spaces. They're, Research is, of course, available on their website, or you could ask them to send it to you in the form of a, a, a PDF. So this is interesting. Um, I think that anytime you're using, and a great place to mine for potential infographic information is right within the projects that your teams are working on. So this firm, LMN, was working on this university. They were doing programming. They were trying to design and, and figure out how much space needed to be allocated to certain buildings rooms within a particular building. So they realized that you know this room, uh, the, the potential size was going to be 100 by 115, height of 60, certain area. And you know this is really not that, our, our brains have a little bit of trouble, uh, mine especially, looking at spreadsheets and just looking at numbers, right? They don't mean a whole lot. But when you take this information and now all of a sudden make it visually graphical, okay, now I can get my head around all right, this is how much space is going to be needed to be dedicated within this bigger building dedicated to a museum, and this is going to be public space. So, of course, you know, they use this in the delivery of their project, but it's a great marketing tool as well to show a potential client that, wow, yeah, we really think through these problems and we help communicate them in a way that your audience, and of course, like if this is a university that needs to go out and fundraise to build, to generate income to build that building, now they've got tools that their service provider has sort of gone uh, above and beyond. So kind of like yesterday when the, we're showing that contractor takes those YouTube videos of a daily progress report, which I thought was incredible, uh, going through a, a bit of a remodel at our house right now, and wow, it would be nice, since I'm out of town for four days, to know what's actually happening at the house uh, from the contractor. So any kind of opportunity where in your project delivery, you have an opportunity to go above and beyond, document it, and then take that and use it as a marketing tool, then I think you're going to be further ahead in, in the program. Another firm that does a great job of incorporating research is EYP, and this is a, a, a program that they put together for how they um, are working, and they're trying to make the case that STEM buildings, the science and technology, uh, and engineering and math buildings are the, the wave of the future. If a university was trying to invest, they should put more emphasis here. Um, they're showing um, how many schools were built here, and then the fact that during, uh, this is actually wrong, it's supposed to be 2000 to 2012, that they added uh, schools. But the concern, of course, with universities is, is, is what their relevance is going to be in the future. So they're making this case that if you were to invest, this is where the number of dollars across the country are going towards buildings. And uh, medical sciences, engineering, math, and science, all those STEM areas, are getting the most um, receipt of dollars towards building uh, buildings. Uh, one particular school, Hamilton, um, showing that STEM majors are increasing, whereas, the, so there's an upward graph here in the red, and the other ones are, are decreasing. Okay, so social media, of course, is a great way to distribute and share your infographic. This is uh, BNIM communicating their uh, 40, 
five years of, of buildings, and they created this really compelling. So rather than, so the typical way that I know firms celebrate anniversaries, because I've designed a lot of them, is some sort of seal of 25 years, and then they put that on their letterhead, and they put that in their email signature, and they get probably a little more excited about that than they, they should. Um, <laughs> and I think we can go a little bit further than just what everybody else does. They commissioned a firm to design this infographic. So around the perimeter, and I'll zoom in a little bit, I realize this is, is tough to see, but you can get a sense of, this is every single one of the projects that they've done in 45 years. Yeah, imagine the typesetting of that. Um, and then they break it down into different areas of uh, you know, public, um, sports, um, government buildings, so you have a sense of kind of what type of sector that they do. And really kind of for them, it must have been illuminating like, wow, you know, we work pretty heavily in this space, uh, and maybe that's good, maybe that's a growth area for them. But it's a quick way for them to see, like, all right, wow, we have a pretty significant impact. You know, infographics can be simply the combination of text and imagery, right? Alone, images are fantastic, and uh, alone, text is powerful. But when you combine those two together, the synergy of them both is infinitesimally, you know, infinitely more effective. So, you know, if you just saw this image, you'd be like, oh, what is going on here? But when you read the caption, it's not every day that a beautifully designed spiral staircase falls from the sky. In our latest project in Manhattan Beach, California, so KA Design took this really you know, timely photograph of this stair spiral staircase. You can't see it, but there's a crane dropping this thing in below. But wow, that's a really powerful image of, uh, of what's going on here. So yeah, social media, this is uh, being utilized on Pinterest, no, sorry, on Instagram. And I'm sure they repeated it uh, throughout other media or other channels as well. SMPS did an infographic. Uh, they took their 25 2016 year in review and communicated all the different things that are happening there. Um, nice use of color, a, a simple palette, um, interesting, lively. And uh, if you go to the SMPS website, you can find this uh, on there as well. They distributed this through, uh, I think I first learned of it via uh, an email blast, but I also saw that it was shown up on LinkedIn and through being promoted through Twitter. So of course, anytime you create something like this because your followers are interacting with your firm on different channels, you want to spread that message out across all the different media because you don't know exactly how somebody is going to access or interact with your firm. And so of course, whatever channel you send it out, it's great to have all this sort of come back to the hub of your website or your blog to be able to be a central repository that that content will live basically forever. And it would be great if you describe that content in the metadata to have keywords that somebody might search for and be able to find your information. So if you work you know, in the medical sciences and you've done an infographic about future of medical buildings, they utilize those keywords that you think that your audience is going to search for so that the visual information is tagged and Google can help your users find that information. Because as we know in some of the channels, once it sort of passes through the feed of that day, it's essentially gone. And I'm not even you know, talking about something you know, like Snapchat that literally disappears. It's just the idea that it's not going to be found by somebody unless it lives on your site in a way that's searchable. So within proposals, let's talk about how infographics can be real effective. A lot of times you have complex schedules that involve a lot of different players. You know, the Gantt chart works really well. Uh, the more you can sort of bring that to life and make that as effective and interesting, the more effective your proposal is going to be. Resumes, of course. I'm going to show you some project experience that can work well. If you have org charts or teams, making that graphically interesting is going to make your proposal stand out. And then, of course, project delivery and how you're going to actually deliver the project. So here's a nice one. This is a construction manager, GAFCON, and uh, reviewing very graphically the different uh, the methods that they're going to use, sort of the process of how that's going to flow through. Um, these are the major milestones in the process and the project. And these, of course, are the sort of sub-milestones that happen 
or it's a further explanation of that particular project. Is that envelope still going around? I know people are taking pictures, and that's that's great. Okay, cool. Um, I, if you came in late, I'm and you didn't have a chance, put your business card in here, and I will email you this, this deck so you can see a lot of these examples on your own desktop. Um, feel free to take pictures, that's fine. I just want to make it as easy as possible for you. Um, again, um, communicating insight. Uh, this is something that could show up in a proposal. If you wanted to give more insight about your culture or your employees, you know, one in four of us live in California, 66. Again, this is several years old. This, I'm sure, is like 95 to 98 now. Um, how we get to work, you know, if you're a firm that is all about environmental and sustainability, uh, it's great to communicate that we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk, or in this case, take the bus. Resumes are something that typically are just done in words, and of course, words are powerful, but wow, if you could add a, a graphic element to make the resumes a little more interesting, um, that would be great. Graphic designers tend to sort of go overboard in some, some of these things. I, I think you could communicate the fact that you spoke Dutch and English um, a little more simply than this. Uh, but I think what this, this guy is saying is that he's fully fluent in Dutch and maybe 90% fluent in English. And it's kind of fun and it's, it's nice as a user to sort of figure this out cleanly. Uh, a self-assessment of his design skills. You know, you could do something like this. Uh, for your technical staff, you know, I think you probably want to have a little asterisk, you know, in saying like how you came up with this, some sort of source that communicates where you're getting your information. Yeah, even something, you know, like pull quotes, adds, if you're adding a testimonial or something about uh, a client is talking about one of your people and you're putting that into a resume, just adding a little graphic interest to say, hey, this information is a little different, it's a quote, and the Pull quote works really well then. Uh, yeah, you know, of course, presentation interviews, you're down to the short list. You have this opportunity to win great work. You want to make the most powerful impact. You've been given a certain amount of time to communicate a lot of information about how great your firm is, how you're going to deliver that project. And the more you can um, be sticky within the jury's mind, the more you're effective you're going to be because they're not going to make a decision right in the moment that you're making that presentation, right? They've got to sit through three to five of these presentations, go off maybe on another day and sort of deliberate as the jury which firm we're going to pick. And if you can be sticky and stay in their mind and be front of mind, you're going to have a higher chance of being chosen. Yes, of course, they're rating you and they maybe have some sort of scorecard as the presentation is going, but as we learned in the very beginning, that visual communication has this ability to stick in people's brains. So utilize that as best as possible within your presentation interviews. You might want to give them the ability to take notes on your presentation here and have kind of a highlight of how your team presented, you know, who are the key players that were at this presentation, making the presentation, some key projects that you worked on. Um, this is like a fictitious one, of course, but you know, an infographic that communicates uh, some supplemental information that's also a takeaway, right? So I said they have to deliberate on a, on a separate location and perhaps day, and having a takeaway or handout gives you that little perhaps leg up on your competition that's in that presentation room. And of course, any time you can tie your presentation to saving the client time or money, the more effective you're going to be. It's really all I'm trying to show you. Most, if not all of you, work in the three-dimensional world. You build buildings, you design interior spaces, you engineer bridges. And so why not take that ability beyond the two-dimensional, right? Everything we've kind of talked about up until now is two-dimensional. It exists on a screen, it exists on paper. But wow, what if you can take that to, into a third dimension? Um, within your offices, perhaps, you create this three-dimensional infographic that communicates the essence of your firm. Perhaps it outlines your core values, or your mission, or your vision in a way that is uh, impactful to anybody that walks by. I mean, it's a sort of museum quality uh, interior signage, or we call it environmental graphic design, that um, 
is really compelling. And, and I can see somebody stopping and, and really taking this in, uh, not only for your internal employees, but visitors that are coming to meet with your firm. And I'm going to talk about either creating them yourself or commissioning them to be created. So let's talk a little bit about creating them yourself. First, you have to sort of think about, like, is an infographic the right way to go? And I, I'm going to give you sort of like a go, no go process of whether or not you should create an into a, a graphic. So ask yourself these few questions. Why is this infographic needed? If you don't have a compelling answer for that, don't move forward. Who is it for? You know, who is the, the, and the, the target audience for that? What should they think, learn, or do as a result of digesting this infographic? And then what is the topic? Get really clear on what the message is and what you're going to be talking about. And then finally think about where you might share this infographic out in the world. So first, how to create. So this would be you or your firm or your marketing staff is going to create. And this is a really great process. Of course, it's an infographic, but you start here. So, you, so you've gone through that, the no-go, no-go. You're going to go. You've selected the topic. Now you start to do the research. You're gathering the data. So you're analyzing the data. Most likely, you're not going to have different people for all these things, right? Um, it's probably going to be you. Uh, finding the narrative, what's the story, what is the compelling information. You start sketching the idea, prototyping it, getting feedback. You might edit that down, like you said, not all the different icons on the page. Uh, and then it moves to the designer. Uh, testing would be a great luxury. And then finally, you complete it and distribute it. So here's some tools. Um, if you're a professional designer, most likely you're using Adobe Illustrator. Uh, this is what we use, um, and you're creating something completely from scratch. If you're not comfortable with that, here are some great tools for you as well. Uh, a tool like Canva has these predetermined templates that allow you to swap out graphics or icons, and then of course you would fill in your own text. So it's moving you along and, and getting you a little bit further from having to create something from a totally intimidating blank page. Uh, Canva has this sort of drag and drop infographic creator, and you can pull from their image library and pull things together. Uh, that's canva.com if you want to find out more. They have a good video on how this whole process works. Uh, Pictochart, easy to use, as they say, infographic. Um, you can start for free. That's pretty compelling. Um, and so same sort of thing. You pick a template. You're not starting from scratch. Um, you're utilizing their existing templates. And uh, another resource is Avisme. This is uh, visme.com. And uh, same sort of thing, like starting with them. But, you know, the, the downside of this, of course, is that it, your infographic could look somewhat similar to somebody else's infographic. Um, but if you're working in totally different spaces or sectors, it's probably not so much of an issue. Uh, had a chance. Uh, working on a, a website for the Orange County chapter of SMPS, one of the board members was really excited to utilize Visme. And anytime you create anything for a nonprofit, you know, the challenge is pulling in imagery and content. You know, your chapter probably doesn't have an image bank of images that you can utilize. So we were like, yeah, if you're excited about this, and we had a sense that the quality was going to be pretty good, we was like, yeah, jump in. So Debbie Beers, who was on the board, uh, created this infographic using Visme that quickly distills their chapter down and their region down into this, you know, nicely done, you know. I, um, if your site is built on the WordPress platform and you want to integrate charts, this is a nice plugin, WordPress charts. So you can create HTML charts, right, not, you know, attach graphics or uh, JPEGs or GIFs, but actual, you know, charts designed in HTML. So this is an interesting little project that this guy did, and there's some tools within this project that I want to share with you that might be effective. Um, this blog, Arc Smarter, um, took the uh, architectural records top 300 firms, right? Their list of firms, and he wanted to create some sort of informational visualization out of those firms. So he downloaded the uh, data, uh, which was available, and he plugged that into a tool from Microsoft called Power BI, um, or no, sorry, Power BL, um, that brings your data to life. 
And he took that data and then created some really interesting sort of realizations of the top 300 architecture firms and realized that most of them happened to be in New York and California um, and you know, broke down revenue by state and design revenue. And so this can be a, a pretty effective tool if you've got data and you want to bring it to life. For different firm types. And I like this conclusion. He says, if I were starting a firm today and wanted to end up in the top uh, 300, I'd put it in California, preferably LA or Pasadena. I'd make sure that no more of a quarter of my revenue came from architectural projects, meaning that you had other services. And uh, of those projects, 80% would be domestic. At least that's what the numbers say. And you know, the power of the infographic is that if you were looking at those charts, you could come up with a similar conclusion. Uh, charted.co is another thing. You can import your CSV file or Google spreadsheet and create pretty compelling uh, data visualization. Here's an example. Um, somebody mentioned word clouds. This wordart.com is a, a resource for that. You can import information about frequency of word uses and create a word cloud. Uh, so if your information, or if you're interested in learning more and becoming more effective, uh, this is a great class taught by Bill Shander uh, on data storytelling. Uh, Skillshare is a great resource, subscription-based learning, and you can uh, take this class and get a lot more savvy. So that might be your homework uh, for, for today. Was there a question? No, just stretching. Nice. <laughs> Um, Pinterest is a great resource for data visualization and getting a sense of how people communicate complex things visually. It's a good idea to have sort of one of these types of reference uh, maps of all the different kinds of charts and think about which way you would want to communicate your data. That nounproject.com I think is a nice resource. I've been using that a lot to find pictograms and little icons that can work really well uh, for proposals, websites, elements of a bigger infographic all work super well for that. I'm a surfer, so I, of course, wanted to check out all the surfing icons. <laughs> all right, some pro tips. Let me show you some infographics and just kind of like quickly break them down into why I think they're effective. Uh, this is a piece that came from the Boston Globe after uh, Poppy hit 500, David Ortiz hit 500 home runs. Um, just a beautifully, I mean, I could look at this thing for days. It's just so <laughs> juicy. I just think it's so well designed. But some things that are happening that you could utilize. Prominent headline, right? Quickly, you know what this information is about. There's a great sense of hierarchy. It's at the top. It's in red. Boom, 500. Um, most likely, if you're a sports fan, you already know who he is and you know what 500 means. And if you don't, it's almost like if you're inside the club, you know, if you don't, don't bother kind of thing. Um, so it's a little bit cryptic on purpose to make people feel like they're part of the club. I love the relationship of the imagery to the headline. The fact that he's looking up and almost worshiping, you know, this 500 that he's just hit. Another thing that makes this incredibly effective is the restrained use of color. I think a lot of times in infographics, you see a whole rainbow of colors, which rainbows are beautiful, but can be incredibly overwhelming for the user or the reader to be able to take down and, and digest this information. Pretty limited palette of black, gray, red, and then just a tiny bit of, uh, of green there for the, um, the home run. So I love this. Shows um, shared appreciation, meaning these are the key, the top five guys that he hit home runs off of. <laughs> <laughs> um, where he stands among all great home run hitters. Where he actually hit, and I just love the sort of um, visual display of, of he hit most of them here, so that circle is bigger, 270 out of the 500, uh, which makes sense. He's a left-hander, so it's easier for him to, to put the ball out of the park in this range. Um, yeah, just, uh, man, we could stay here for days, but we got to move on. Um, so in contrast, you know, this I would not put up as probably a best practice. Again, I think overwhelming in terms of style of illustration and color and it just everything kind of competes for your attention anytime you're designing something the principle of design is hierarchy leading someone through the process in an organized way is going to be incredibly more effective 
So for example, limited color palette, this is an overview of a, a firm, uh, a site that we designed, and we limited the palette to their corporate colors, and you can take in quick information. Uh, limited number of fonts, again, you don't want this to be a ransom letter of all different types of fonts. <laughs> So limit that to, you know, we used Avenir and, um, I'm spacing on this one, uh, email me and I'll tell you. <laughs> agency, thank you, Bureau Agency. Yep, another fellow graphic designer, thanks for it. And uh, an infographic we designed for a private jet suite. Here, you know, color makes a lot of sense. We wanted to utilize that to show, you know, like orange is their premium light jets. We wanted to show how far coming from San Diego you could go. You could go to these cities if you utilized orange. Also, keeping along with that, this is how many people can fit in that plane, how much luggage can be brought, um, you know, max speed. So, you know, again, but it's a limited palette, right? We're using these same colors to mean something. They have uh, significance in that they represent a particular category. Uh, don't worry about this. Um, but what I want you to focus on is here. So it's real easy to sort of spout off information, and if you're the expert, to add credibility, I think you want to list your sources. You want to be really clear about where that data is coming from and where you got that information. And I see that missing from a lot of infographics. And maybe it is an asterisk that leads somebody to, like in this case, this, this source list takes up almost as much information as the actual infographic. Um, which maybe was part of their legal requirement, I don't know. But it might be even more effective if you just offer a link that somebody could go to and then read through the, the entire list of sources. But add, you know, be uh, forthright and transparent about where you're getting your information if you're using it in a, in a presentation. Um, as you're prototyping, uh, a best practice uh, is to come up with a couple different solutions, right? So this was what we were doing uh, for Somas's website. We wanted to show two different design directions, exact same data and information, but we showed it in one of two ways. So either A or B. Which one did they pick? You're right. That's where they went. So we had to go through that process to help them feel like that was the right solution. All right, so that's your creating it yourself. If you're commissioning infographics, if you're hiring somebody to do those uh, outside your firm, here are some resources. Visually, uh, vi, it's visually.ly, is basically like a, an agency for, well, they, they offer several different things, but one of which is infographics. You can find somebody, um, their work starts at $3,000, but they basically pre-vetted designers that specialize in infographics, and these are, tend to be the more sort of complex ones that involve illustration and words, um, but this is a great way to uh, find somebody that's an expert at infographics. And this is how the process, you get a quote, you chat about the project, you fill out a brief, and then they match you with a, a talented team. You know, you could go also go out and, and hire a graphic designer, just make sure that they have some experience and they can show you uh, some examples, because an infographic is its sort of own unique animal, and uh, just because somebody can uh, design a page layout doesn't mean, necessarily mean they're, they're great at infographics. So any questions about how to commission or how to create infographics on your own? Yes? And know what font it's in? I don't know uh, how to do it that way. Um, if it's on a website and it's uh, HTML coded, there's a, there's a plugin I have in, like in my browser called Font, F-O-U-N-T. And if I roll my mouse over that word, it tells me what font it is. Yes? OK, perfect. Thank you. Did everybody get that? Whatthefonts.com. He'll be here all week. All right, so just real quickly, review. Um, we talked about why infographics make sense. And the sort of clear, quick answer is that they distill information into something that's digestible, it's memorable, and it sticks in people's minds. We shared where some best practices are. They can show up on websites, in proposals, 3D and beyond. We shared about how to create infographics. You can either commission them yourself, or you can go out and hire somebody to do them 
uh, for you as, as well. So it was great to have you here. I'll be hanging out if you have questions. Uh, again, I'll be emailing you the, the slide deck. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, and thanks so much for coming today.